Hello, I previously said that this video was going to be on dab trees, but I realized that there's actually a lot of additional material to cover on the topic of pr general pre-collision detection optimizations, and it makes sense to put it all on its own video to complement the dab trees and the, the later spatial partitioning videos that I'm going to be doing right afterwards. This topic is a science on its own. Not all optimizations discussed here will work in every situation, and there's going to be tons of situational tweaks that can be implemented depending on what your application is. But that's a benefit of writing your own physics engine. You can build your own optimizations based on what you're doing. Based on the information provided so far in this series, you should be able to build a very simple game where every object is tested against every other object by checking their circular or rectangular bounding areas. Now, I know I said that bounding areas are more useful as optimizations, and I'm gonna get more into that in this video, but just table that for a minute and pretend that we wanted to do a collision detection between a bunch of axis aligned rectangles. Suppose that you had three movable rigid rectangles that you wanted to do collision tests on. How many collision checks would be required in this system? Well, for the first object, you're going to need to test it against the other two objects, and then you only need to check the second object against the third object, and then you're done. So three objects, three collision tests. What if you had six rigid bodies to do collision tests on? Well, again, the first object, you'd have to test it against five. The second object would have to be tested against four others, and so on, and so on, for a total of 15 collision tests. So you've doubled the number of objects, but the number of collision tests required has gone up by a factor of 5. And this pattern continues, so if you had 100 rigid bodies, that's about 5,000 collision tests. And if you had 1,000 bodies, that's almost half a million collision tests. And believe me, 1,000 objects is really not a lot. Uh, there are a lot of games that have over 1,000 objects in the playing field all at the same time. And that takes up a lot of processing time. If you had to do half a million collision tests every update, then that's 30 million collision tests every second if you're doing 60 frames per second. So our objective is to prune out as many of these collisions as possible. There are four genres of pre-collision detection optimizations that we're going to talk about in this video. The first is using simple bounding areas. The second is to prune out collisions that you know are impossible. The third is to prune out collisions that you don't care about. And the fourth is to parallelize where possible. I think the vast majority of pre-collision optimizations fall under one of these four categories. But, you know, there might be more, and obviously I can't talk about everything in this one video. So again, if you have anything to contribute to this discussion, then post it in the comments and I can update the video description. The first type of optimization is using bounding areas. And I already talked about this in the last video, so if you haven't seen that, go watch it. But the motivation here is that doing complex polygon collisions is hard, but doing bounding area collisions is easy. And when I'm saying easy and hard, I'm not talking about the algorithms to detect and resolve collisions. I'm actually talking about the computational difficulty of detecting those collisions. Now, I already alluded to this, but the bounding areas can be the actual shapes that you want to test in your collision engine. And if that's the case, you never need to recalculate your bounding areas. But if your physics engine incorporates objects that rotate or change their size, then you will. Calculating the bounding box for a polygon is pretty straightforward. You just need to loop through all of the vertices of the polygon and take the maximum and minimum x and y values. This is complicated by the fact that those x and y values change as the shape rotates. So before you can use a bounding box to do a preliminary collision test for a polygon, you may first need to recalculate the bounding box by calculating all of the rotated positions for each vertex. Don't worry, I'll hook you up with some free maths right here. This coordinate system assumes that right and up are positive, and that alpha in this case would represent a negative angle. If the up direction were negative, then alpha would have to be positive for these equations to work. So just make sure that you tweak this so that it works with your coordinate system and don't just copy my equations. Oh, and if you know that your shape is symmetrical in advance, you can use the property of that symmetry to reduce the superfluous use of trig functions. But I'll leave that up to you to work out. And don't forget to cache the bounding box whenever it's recalculated so that if you ever need to re-reference it before the shape gets rotated again, you'll be able to do that. 
For instance, the same shape may be involved in multiple collisions within a single update. To reduce the likelihood of false preliminary collisions, it's important for the bounding box to be as close to the shape as possible. But that comes at a price. If you have a really tight bounding box, then as the shape rotates, that bounding box has to continuously be recalculated. One trade-off that might increase performance in some cases is just to add some padding to your bounding box so that it completely encompasses any possible rotation. Or instead of using bounding boxes, you can use bounding circles. That brings me to the final optimization that I'm going to talk about regarding bounding areas, which is how do you choose between a bounding box and a bounding circle as the basis for preliminary collision tests? Well, it might seem that bounding boxes are inefficient because they involve a lot of trig functions, but imagine if you were building a platform game where everything is basically a rectangle and nothing ever rotates, then it makes sense to use bounding boxes. But if you're building a game where everything is a circle or everything rotates, then the obvious answer is to go with bounding circles. At the end of the day, this is something that you just need to decide on your own. There's no way I can give you an answer that will work for every situation. The next class of optimization that we're going to explore involves early pruning of collisions that we know are impossible. There are a few properties that we can exploit. The first is that objects tend not to just teleport or appear and disappear or change their shape and size, and they also tend to be spaced out from one another. Now these are not universal truths, but they are violated infrequently enough to make most simulations relatively predictable. One of the most common ways to accomplish early pruning is through the use of hierarchical bounding areas. So suppose that you had a bunch of polygons in your simulation. What you could do is group them based on their proximity to one another. And now you know that if these boxes are not colliding, then the shapes that are inside of those boxes cannot be colliding with any of the shapes that are in any of the other boxes. This already significantly reduces the number of collisions that need to be checked each update. But we can do even better. We can group the two boxes on the left, and that way the box on the right has one fewer collision that it needs to check each update. What we've just built is a dab tree, and I'm going to go into a lot more detail on how this works and how we built these trees in the next video. So hold that thought. I'm also going to introduce another hierarchical bounding area algorithm, which is fairly common, called quad trees. This really takes advantage of the fact that objects tend not to overlap with each other. Usually they push each other apart, right? So it's reasonable to expect that they would be spaced out. Then you can divide the space within the simulation into quadrants so that each quadrant has fewer shapes that need to be tested against one another. Any shapes that are on a border, like the one you see on the left there, can be tested in each quadrant that they overlap. If too many shapes appear in the same quadrant, then that quadrant can be subdivided into its own set of quadrants, and then you can repeat these steps on each of those quadrants. So you can see that each unit of area has very few collisions that need to be tested, and so this is a huge optimization. Anyway, quad trees really deserve their own video, so I'll be doing that in a couple videos from now, because I think there's a lot more that I can say about them. If you are using hierarchical bounding trees, then you may be able to improve the performance of those trees by excluding objects that are not moving. So here's the same dab tree from earlier, except now I've drawn all applicable bounding boxes. In order to test this tree, you would start from the top box and then work your way in to the deeper and deeper boxes until ultimately you're testing the individual pairs of polygons against each other. Now it's already pretty efficient, but what's the point of retesting an object that hasn't moved since the last time you tested it? So hear me out. You don't test anything that hasn't moved. And then let's say the blue triangle moves. What you do is you trickle up through the tree until you reach the top node, letting everything along the way know that it needs to be retested. At first glance that might seem like a lot, but the alternative is that on every single update you would have to trickle down through the node to test every pair of polygons. The next class of optimization are pruning out collisions that we just don't care about. Here's how I like to think about it. There are four tiers of objects. On the bottom you have non-rigid bodies. These are bodies that you still want to be able to detect collisions when they happen, 
but they don't interact with physical objects. For example, fire. Character walks into fire, you want to know that they're walking into fire so you can reduce their health, but you, you know the fire isn't going to bounce off of them. Chances are you probably don't need to test collisions between non-rigid bodies, though there could be exceptions to this rule. Next up is stationary objects. This includes the ground, walls, obstacles, and other things that don't move. There's really no need to be testing stationary objects against other stationary objects. So just rule out that entire branch of collisions. And also, there's typically never going to be a point of testing stationary objects against non-rigid bodies. Tier 3 is objects on rails. This includes moving platforms, boats, elevators, planets, whatever. These would follow the same rules as stationary objects, except that if you have them in a hierarchical bounding area, then you're going to need to update that structure as they move. That being said, if you have an object on rails which is in a relatively isolated area, then you might be able to get a performance boost by wrapping it in a very large bounding box that encompasses the entire range of motion. Or if you're okay with having some additional complexity to your code, you could double wrap it so that the object itself is in a small bounding box but the entire range of motion is in a larger bounding box. But I'm just speculating. And the last tier on this ladder is the movable rigid body, which interacts with everything, including itself, except it doesn't do collision resolution when colliding with non-rigid bodies. Anyway, so this is a framework that I found is pretty useful, and you can kind of build your code around this. And you can also set up rules to emulate behaviors like turning friendly fire off. You can accomplish this by tagging each rigid body and then providing each rigid body with a list of tags to ignore when doing their collision detection. The final optimization I'm going to talk about is multi-threading. And there's really not too much to say here other than that uh, collision detection is usually a good time to do multi-threading because it has to do with a lot of checks, a lot of reads, but not too much in the way of writes. So collision detection is something that is somewhat thread friendly. And you could probably do collision resolution as well, but you gotta be really careful that objects bouncing off each other don't end up crashing into new objects that are being set by other threads. So if you're gonna use multi-threading to do collision resolution, then make sure that all your threads are moving objects that are far away from each other. All right guys, that's all for now. Stay tuned for dab trees.